history all the immortal dies who can explore his strange design in vain the first born seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine tis mercy
So last September, we launched into an extended three-part sermon series as a way to celebrate 200 years of God's goodness at KCC, in Keswick Christian Church and through Keswick Christian Church. In part one, you might remember, we glanced back to remember. Can you say to remember? Remember. To remember. To, to remember some of KCC's history, how it began by a young lady, a young married lady named Mary Stogdale, who lived in New York, came with her husband as a pioneer to Georgina, to Upper Canada. Confederation would, wouldn't be a thing for another 46 years. And she came up and found that there was no church that she could worship in, like she had back home in New York. So she wrote back, and I think it was over a period of a year or two, she was persistent. She persevered. And finally, in response to her invitation to her letters to come on up here, there's a big need in Georgina, a a pastor by the name of Alan Huntley came up. And they started to meet in the home of Darius Mann. Just a a home, right? Well, on October of 1821, in the chilly waters of Lake Simcoe, Alan Huntley, with the momentum that God used from Mary Stogdale and the hospitality of Darius Mann, they baptized 10 people in Lake Simcoe 200 years ago last October. And 43 charter members joined what was then to be called Keswick Christian church. You know, that was 25% of all of Georgina. The whole pop. This church was a quarter of the population of this area. So you can imagine what wonderful goodness that we experienced at our launch point. So back in the fall, back in September, we looked at important things that God urges all of his people from all time to remember, to remember about him, to remember about what he's done. And you'll remember this. It's important for us to glance back, just glance. It's more important for us to gaze forward. And so we took a the necessary look back, but where we wanted to linger was to lock into the future, into what God has ahead for us. So on our anniversary Sunday, we pivoted. We turned our focus to part two, to renew. Can you say renew? Renew. To renew the purpose that God calls us to, that God has always been calling his people to uh, from the very beginning. 
He's calling us to be pursuing life in Christ. You say that. He's calling us to be pursuing life in Christ. One more time. Pursuing life in Christ. And of course, the way we do that is to pursue Christ, to pursue Jesus. We learned how important it is for us to be loving God, to be living God's word, to be growing with God's people, to be going into God's world and to be investing in God's work. Who's the hero in all this? God. Yeah, God is. And so that's how part two ended. At the turn of the year, January, we began part three. We began a journey through the book of Daniel to, to recommit ourselves. Would you say that? To, to recommit ourselves to God who has lavished such goodness on us in Jesus. In Jesus. And so to recommit ourselves to a life like Daniel's, a life of steady, focused, unfading loyalty to the loving Lord that we have come to know, to the one who has just showered his goodness on us for so many decades. Today, we wrap up this extended series with a look at costly loyalty. And we'll do it with two portraits. Yes, of course, one of the snapshots that we're going to look at this morning is Daniel. right? Daniel, the guy that we've looked at, a real historical person in the Bible, Uh, in Babylon. But the other snapshot we want to study today, I want you to get to know today, is that of a more recent chap named Ezra. Ezra Jibe. You've heard of him. You will. Two men, Daniel and Ezra, separated by about 2,500 years, 2,500 years, with one thing in common, a costly loyalty to God. So I I just feel like we need to pray again. We really need God to be working on our hearts, shall we? And so God, because you are the God of heaven, the God over heavens and over the earth, you're the God most high. As we look at these two lives quickly today, one in your word the other a part, a more recent part of your plan, would you help us to see what you want to build in us, to what you want to strengthen in us? Lord, teach us. We're listening. Shape us. We're soft. We want to be more like Jesus, we pray. In his name, we pray it. Amen. So a man named Ezra was sitting on his heels like good Africans always do, and he was watching the late African sun set onto the horizon. In front of them was this wide river, hundreds of meters wide, flowing fast like a current, but that current wasn't enough water to douse the trouble that was in his heart. You see... Ezra had come here, and he was pleading before God, saying, God, why would you bring us here and make it come to this? Why? Years before, Ezra had come to know the good news of Jesus, that Jesus, God, so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would never perish far from God forever, but have eternal life together with God forever. That good news had transformed Ezra years before, and he knew that that good news of Jesus propelled him to these parts where people had not yet heard the good news of Jesus, and that's why he was here. He knew that God wanted him here. He had come in with his family to this village. They had met the chief, big, bad chief, Domogo. Just try to say it. Chief. Oh, you got it. Chief Domogo. And the chief had said, oh, welcome, no problem. You can just build your hut outside of the village there on the outskirts of town. Come, you know, shop in our marketplace. Enjoy our life together. We want you here. But 
Every time Ezra or his wife went to the market, the people were ready with their smiles, but they said, you know, fish are scarce now. All that water. Fish are just not doing so well now, you know. We got no rice like we used to. We just got no food. There was food, but not for Ezra, not for his wife, on Chief Domago's orders. He had said, smile, be friendly, but let's starve those strangers out of town. And so, of course, Ezra was beside this river. He was listening to his baby, their baby, wailing in the background, in the hut, who was starving, as he and his wife were as well. And so he just prayed, Lord, with a plea that could just reach the other side of the river, would you please Help me reach Chief Domogo's heart. Just like that, there was a rustle in the bush not far from where he was standing, where he was praying, and he knew, the experienced hunter that he was, he knew exactly what it was. He went back to his house, back to the hut, picked up the one important implement that he knew. And he went back to that spot and waited for it again. Don't worry. <laughs> You're safe. <laughs> but I'm serious. <laughs> he waited for it to happen again. And sure enough, when those leaves on the bushes moved the way a hunter recognized, he aimed his spear, he let it fly straight true with strength, and it hit, he knew, it hit its mark, and it thudded to the ground, still. He knew. So he turned back and he says, wife, wife, stoke up the fire. We're going to finally have a feast tonight. Stoke it up. Oh, he was so excited. He went back. <coughs> excuse me, back to the spear, picked it up and fo <laughs> followed it all the way in and he had just speared Chief Domago's favorite hunting dog. <laughs> there it was. Dead. True story. Where does costly loyalty come from, Christian? Where does an unflinching commitment plant itself so it can stand firm, unmoved, without wavering, resolute, devoted to God no matter what? Well, for some weeks now, we've watched Daniel's devotion to God, haven't we? We've learned so much. Where did his come from? We're going to just take a stroll through the book of Daniel and touch on some high points. If you have your Bible with you, what I have done in mine is highlight the verses, underline the verses that we're gonna just touch on today. And let's ask God in this stroll through Daniel to stoke and to strengthen our loyalty as well. So you'll remember that in Daniel chapter one, he and his three friends, they're in their teens, they're youngsters, <clears throat> their youth, They've been ripped away from family and from everything familiar by war. They've been flung to foreign parts, to Babylon, never to really fit in. They've been crammed as misfits into godless identities. And yet, chapter 1, verse 8, do you see it? Chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel resolved. Would you say those two words with me? Go. Daniel resolved. He committed ahead of time. He predecided to stand loyal to God. In this case, it was that he would not defile himself. That he, would not de that he wouldn't go the way the world was heading, no matter how tasty, how tempting, how tantalizing it might be. And what a great example for us. To resolve. 
not to defile ourselves. Whether you're young, as young as Daniel, or you pre, you know, you're younger than Daniel was there, or whether you and I are young at heart and wish we were that young, this commitment can still happen for us. Lifelong loyalty is predecided before it's tested. It's pre-chosen before it goes under the, into the crucible. So don't wait until you're tempted to go, what shall I do in this choice? Don't wait until then. You know, when you and I are driving cars, we don't wait until we're in the intersection to decide where to turn, do we? We do that and we'll cause a wreck. We'll cause a pile up. No, that kind of decision must be anticipated. We've got to choose where to turn in advance or we make a wreck of things. So, Christian, preset your devotion. Pre-choose your allegiance. Pre-decide now. Now for later. Daniel did, and he did it in his teens, guys, for a lifetime, for a lifetime. What was the result? We'll look at chapter 1, verse 9. God gave Daniel favor and compassion. God gave Daniel favor and compassion. You see that in verse 9 there. And then look at verse 17. Uh, God gave him and his friends standout results as well. In the final exam, with all that they had learned in this whole new culture, this whole new potential of influence in Babylon, God made them standouts. And God gave them a whole new position in the king's cabinet, influence on the king. But you'll remember this, right? Their preset allegiance didn't guarantee that life would all go smoothly, right? And it doesn't for us either. It certainly didn't for Ezra. He had just killed Chief Domugo's favorite hunting dog. Well, he just left the carcass there with a spear still stuck in it. And he went back to his position by the river, just pouring out his heart to God. Lord, I just prayed that you would help me reach Chief Domugu's heart. And why? How? Well, a thought interrupted that prayer. It went something like this. Ezra, don't be so stupid, man. Why don't you just go to the dog, take out the spear, pick it up and throw it in the river. The current is going so fast and so strong that in a few days' time when the vultures are doing their cleanup, nobody will even see them. And when Chief Domago goes, where's my hunting dog? You go, what? What dog? Haven't seen it for days. <laughs> but there was another voice Another thought that was louder and clearer that said, um, no one will ever know, I will know. Ezra, I have bought you at great cost. I have brought you here. Now you go and do the right thing, even if it's hard. Daniel and his buddies had pre-chosen what they would do. They'd already chosen. And in chapter 2, we saw it. Their lives didn't just get hard. Their lives got threatened. Remember that? Because God had given them that position in cabinet, because God had favored them, they got into hard times. Hmm. Hmm. So Daniel, we watched him, he, he calmly gathers the facts. What's going on here? Why are our lives at risk? And he gathers his friends, and just like Ezra did at the side of the river, he urged them together to earnestly seek mercy from the God of heaven, to seek mercy from the God over all. Prayer 
We've seen this in Daniel. We saw it especially in chapter six. It's what got him tossed to the lions. We saw it in chapter nine, how he prayed. Prayer for Daniel was fueled on diligent study of God's word. And it was a lifelong constant that propelled Daniel's loyalty. It fueled his loyalty. Under this threat, they know, Daniel and his buddies, know whose servants they are first of all. Not King Nebuchadnezzar's. No, they are servants of the God of heaven. They're servants of the God over all. But notice that word in, verse, in that verse there, in verse 18, mercy. They didn't plead for fairness. They didn't plead for justice. They pled for mercy. They, in their vocabulary, there was no God, you owe us here. We've been so loyal to you, God. Like, really? Why would we get this in, in, in payment? No. Who can ever give anything to God that God should repay him? No, God, are, God is never indebted to anyone. Not, God doesn't have to repay our loyalty either. When we seek him in our trouble, we don't go, God, what's wrong? This is unfair. No, we plead, humbly plead for mercy, for mercy. When God answered, their gratitude spilled over so that it actually showed where their loyalty was anchored. Look at verses 20 through 22. They, these guys, they didn't stop praying. Now they shifted to gratitude and to thanksgiving. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. God, this God, the God we've been pleading to who's just answered us is the all wise. This God, all power is his. Verse 21, he changes times and season. He removes kings and sets up kings. He's the king over every king. He's the king maker and he's the king breaker. He's the king. He's the king. He, they went on, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. This God, our God, who we pled to for mercy, who's answered us like this, he knows everything. And he loves to make his ways known to the humble. If you're taking notes, write Psalm, verse 25, uh, Psalm chapter 25, verse 9. God shows his ways to the humble, to the humble, to the prayerful. Daniel then hurried to the palace, you remember that? And he humbly stands before the most powerful person on the planet to point faithfully, not to himself, look what I got for you, I got the answer for you, King Neb. Uh-uh. To faithfully point to this higher king. Verse 28, see it in your Bibles? There is a God in heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, a God over you. Verse 37, who has given you the power you've got, the king over everything. You see verse 44, whose eternal kingdom is coming will smash every earthly kingdom. He, Nebuchadnezzar, has given you a preview of what's next because he, the God of heaven, commands all the what's nexts. He's the king of everything. He's the, he's the king in command of what's coming. He's the king of kingdoms. He's the king of history, past, present, future. And he's the king of everything. Everything. So mark this down. Lifelong loyalty never forgets. I'm that God's servant first. I'm the servant of the king of everything. No matter what privilege he's entrusted to me, no matter what kind of position I might hold, I serve God most high. Daniel's loyalty was locked there. Is yours? Is yours? Ask yourself, test yourself, examine yourself. Is yours? In chapter three, Daniel's friends are tested literally by fire by fire. 
Can this God of ours be trusted even if he chooses not to rescue us from godless laws or death threats? Well, what was their answer? Here's what they answered even before it played out. God most high deserves to be served above all gods at all costs, even to death. They said that before anything played out, before anything was concluded. And so my question is, is that where your loyalty and mine is locked in? Is that where it's locked on? Hmm. God didn't have to rescue them. They knew that. But when he chose to save them from the furnace, from inside the flames, they found themselves standing in front of the gawking, sputtering Nebuchadnezzar who had to admit in public, look at chapter 3, verse 29, and highlight it. There is no other God who is able to rescue this way. No other one. So, Christian, can I challenge us to long to long for God to give us a loyalty that doesn't flinch in the face of death. We'll all face death at some point. Our lives might not be threatened. We might go through hardship. Unless Jesus comes back first, we will all face death. Does your loyalty allow you to lean into that without flinching because it's focused on somebody much more powerful, much, much higher. How was that going to go for Ezra? Would he be rescued? What should he do with Chief Domogo's dead dog? Somebody does know. Don't just throw that carcass in the river, I know. I bought you at a great price. You're mine. So, you do what's right, even if it's hard. Well, Ezra got right up. He knew who was in command. He'd pre-decided that. And he went back to his house, just a few steps away, and he grabbed all his life savings just a few coins wrapped up in a wrinkled handkerchief. He tucked it away and he went back to where the spear was and he followed that all the way in, pulled the spear out of the dead dog, picked up the dog, put it gently on his shoulders and marched off, headed in the direction of the village. Now by this time, the sun had set and he knew that in the village, they would all be out, outside enjoying the first cool of the evening, the African evening. He could hear the drums going in the distance. He could hear the, the children laughing. He could hear the laughter and chatter of the women and the men. But he knew as he marched lockstep loyal with God that at the other side of the clearing in the village, he would see Chief Domogu there on his favorite stump the log of a tree, and on either side of him would be his two henchmen. And they would be slapping their hippopotamus whips, hippopotamus leather whips, into the other palm, just itching to give them some use. He knew what was coming. As he entered the perimeter of the village, all the chatter stopped, everything stopped. The drums stopped. The children froze. There was one little old lady. They went, ah! And Ezra kept marching towards the chief. When he finally got there, he placed Chief Domingo's dead dog down on the ground. And of course, when he looked up, all he could see was chief's eyes bulging with disbelief. He backed up and he said, Chief, I was starving. I didn't know what to do. My wife and child are starving. I thought that the movement near my house was game. I thought it was supper, but I was wrong. I've just speared your favorite hunting dog. This will never compensate for it. I'm sorry. I apologize. 
And then he began to take off his shirt because he knew what was coming. Humility flows from a heart flooded with loyalty to God, to God Most High. Humility plays out when you know that God is king over everything, even now, even here, even when it's hard. God had used Daniel's humility to humble an arrogant tyrant. Do you remember that? Would he do that for Ezra? Back then in Daniel's day, when the once arrogant and now humbled Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God really is the most high, that he wasn't, his reason returned to him. And look at chapter 4, verse 34. In his words, this is like the centerpiece of the book of Daniel. Bracket it, highlight it, memorize it if you can, right? I bless the most high, says this pompous king now humbled. I bless the most high, there is a most high, and praised and honored him who lives forever. And he keeps going, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. See verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as, you say it, compared to the most high. All the inhabitants of the earth are treasures to him, valuable to him, but by comparison are nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven, the angel armies, and among, excuse me, among the inhabitants of the earth, everybody that populates the face of the planet, and none can stay his hand or say to God, what have you done? You see what King Nebuchadnezzar realized? You think you can stop God? I thought so. Huh? You think you can correct God? I thought so. Huh? No. God is king over everything. And this, from the mouth of the most powerful person on the planet at that time. So look at verse 37. He said, chapter 4, verse 37, Now I praise I extol, I honor the king of heaven. I'm putting him exalted in the place that he deserves. For all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride like I did, like I was, he is able to humble. You see why hum humility flows from that kind of a heart? Would that happen with Chief Domago? Or would the whips fly? Get up! Ezra got up. At this point, Chief Domago's eyes were bulging with anger. His neck veins were popping. And if it were even possible, there'd be smoke coming out his ears. Get up! He did. Ezra, I've never seen a man like you. If any of these guys had killed my favorite hunting dog, you know what they would have done? They would have picked it up, thrown it in the river, and in a few days' time, the current would have taken it long gone. And when the vultures were cleaning it up, and I went, where's my dog? They'd have gone, what dog? Haven't seen it for days. You're different. You tell the truth even when it's costly. No, I need to say sorry to you. I was the one starving you out of town. I've never met a man like you who wants to tell the truth when it's this hard. Now, tell us what you've been trying to tell us. You got our ears. And that whole evening, God answered Ezra's prayer. Help me reach Chief Domago's heart. That evening, he had not just ch the chief's ears. He had the ears and the full, un undistracted attention of the whole village. 
And this bone-thin man shared them the good news of Jesus. The God so, the God that made them so loved them that he sent his one and only son to die for them, to forgive them, to give them the righteousness they could never earn and never deserved. And he said, this is who I want you to know. He gave them the gift. He gave them the opportunity to trust in God's goodness for them through the Lord Jesus. And that evening, not only Chief Domingo, but all of his wives, not just just the henchmen, but all of their wives, not just the whole village, but everybody in the village and everybody in the surrounding countryside came to trust Jesus as their sin taker, as their sovereign. Why? Because a bone thin man with a dead dog told them about the living savior that they needed so badly at extreme cost to himself. Talk about such loyalty. You know, it wasn't, news like that runs rampant, doesn't it? It sped, the news of this dead dog and the living savior spread all over the the surrounding villages. And by the time that Kathy and I went to Africa as missionaries in the 1990s, where we went in our region, that was the reason why Ezra and Domago was the reason why they were already dozens of churches. There were already hundreds of of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ because, because there was one man who decided he would do the right thing even though it was hard because of his costly loyalty to his living Savior. You know, Daniel's long life has taught us that costly loyalty is locked on to who God is. Focused on him, the God who is the king of everything, the God who is our rescue, the God who is the holy one we humble ourselves before and confess our wrongs to, the one, the God who is the one in command of angel armies, the one who perfectly writes all of the what next before they even happen, the one who will one day trample the greatest evil of all, the one who will judge the living and the dead, the one who will one day set up his kingdom as promised and will rule in righteousness forever, forever. Costly loyalty wisely locks, wisely locks its focus on and stays in lockstep with the king of everything. And why not? And why wouldn't you? Do you know that Daniel's name means God is my judge. God is my judge. And God, God most high, helped him to live up to his name every single day. Daniel lived like God was watching every day. He lived devoted to God's presence every day. He lived like one day he would give an account to God for all of his days. And as a result, remember this? He lived under God's delight every day. He was greatly loved. Greatly loved. You say it. Greatly loved by God. So let me ask us, is that where your loyalty is locked onto? Is that where it springs from? If it is, you are wise. You are wise. And so Daniel 12, verse 3, highlight it, concludes... And those who are wise, like Daniel, like Ezra, shall shine, shall shine in the dark, in the difficult, even when it gets painful, they'll shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, those who open, the, introduce others to Jesus as their forgiver, as their righteousness giver will shine like the stars forever and forever. 
Proverbs chapter four, verses 18 and 19 say something similar. Listen, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter, expelling the darkness until the full light of day. Verse 19, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't even know what they stumble over. Our world is getting darker. God, no surprise there, right? God told us it would. Our world is getting harder and more painful, more unwelcome to God lovers. So the question as we come to the end of our three-part series celebrating 200 years of God's goodness is this. Will you and I dare to be a Daniel? Will we dare to focus like Ezra did, to focus on and be in lockstep with the king of everything? Or do we have competing kings? Now is the time to commit, KCC. Now is the time to lock in and to recommit. And so my prayer for all of us is that God will help us remember and renew and recommit to him in extravagant ways so that others can come and enjoy his goodness in Jesus the way that we have. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, that's our desire. You alone are our strength and our shield. You alone are our treasure, the treasure of the universe. You alone can satisfy. You alone can save. And so together, Lord, together, we recommit to you as our king, the king of everything. In Jesus' name, amen.